Hello, I'm Dr. Geeta Sinha from the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology. This is the first video of the abdomen series. In this video, I will introduce you to the surface anatomy of abdomen. I will talk about the peritoneum, anterior abdominal wall, its blood supply, nerve supply, and lymphatic drainage. Lastly, I will cover the inguinal region. The abdomen contains most of the gastrointestinal system as well as the spleen, the upper portion of the urinary system, the kidneys and the ureter, and the adrenal glands. The abdomen is bordered superiorly by the dome of the diaphragm. The spleen, much of the liver, and the stomach, and gallbladder are protected by the overlying diaphragm and ribs 6 to 12. The kidneys and adrenal gland lie in the superior and posterior portion of the abdominal cavity and their superior portion are protected by the lower ribs. Here in a prosection in which the abdominal contents have been removed, this is the opening for the inferior vena cava through the central tendon of the diaphragm at T8. Here is the esophageal hiatus at T10 and here is the aorta lying posterior to the diaphragm and anterior to the T12 vertebral body. The esophageal hiatus is a location of clinical importance where the stomach may herniate into the thorax. This skeletal muscle is quadratus lumborum and this is psoas muscle. The arcuate ligament of the diaphragm bridge the gap over these muscles and give attachment to the diaphragm. This is the left and this is the right crest of the diaphragm. Inferiorly, the abdomen is continuous with the pelvic inlet, the margins of which are demarcated by the sacral promontory, the ala of the sacrum, the arcuate line, the pectineal line, and the pubic thrust. At this surface, the abdominal cavity is continuous with the pelvic cavity. Notice that the plane of the pelvic inlet is not transverse. It's oblique, like so. Since the pelvic cavity is continuous with the abdominal cavity, enlarging masses such as uterus or a urinary bladder can extend superiorly into the abdomen. Visual landmarks include the zephoid process, costal margin, the anterior superior elect spine, the umbilicus, and the pubic tubercle. The anterior abdomen can be subdivided into four quadrants by vertical and horizontal lines, which both pass through the umbilicus, making the right upper quadrant left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant. In each quadrant, there are clinically important structures. In the right upper quadrant, there is liver, gallbladder, and duodenum. In the left upper quadrant, there is spleen. In the right lower quadrant, there is appendix and ileum. In the left lower quadrant, there is the descending and the sigmoid colon. The geogenum is roughly located at the umbilicus and the urinary bladder is located just superior to the pubis. In non-obese individuals, the umbilicus is located between vertebral level L3 and L4 and at the T10 dermatome. The abdomen can also be divided into nine zones demarcated by the left and right midclavicular lines. A horizontal line at the inferior margin of the costal margin, subcostal line at L2, and a horizontal line joining the two tubercles of the elect crest transtubercular line at L5. The regions are called the right hypochondrium epigastric left hypochondrium, 
right lumbar, umbilicus, left lumbar, right groin, suprapubic, left groin. Beneath the skin is subcutaneous layer of fat and connective tissue. Below the umbilicus, this subcutaneous tissue divides into a superficial fatty layer, campus fascia, and a deep membranous layer, scarpus fascia. Scarpus fascia fuse with the fascia lot of the thigh. Above the umbilicus, campus and scarpus fascia layers are fused. Scarpus fascia is of clinical importance as underneath there is a potential closed space that does not open into thigh but is continuous with the penis, scrotum and perineum. Deep to the superficial fascia and anterolaterally there are three muscles. From superficial to deep these are external oblique, internal oblique and transverse abdominis. There is one vertical muscle located medially. This is called the rectus abdominis. Here is the anterior superior iliac spine pubic tubercle and iliac crest. Here is the external oblique muscle. The external oblique takes its origin from the lowest eight ribs. It inserts on the linea alba via tendinous aponeurosis and forms the rectus sheath. The lower free border of the external oblique aponeurosis folds in on itself and is called the inguinal ligament. The internal oblique muscle takes its origin from the thoracolumbar fascia, not visible here, the iliac crest and the inguinal ligament. It inserts on the lower three ribs, the linea alba, where it forms the rectus sheath. Lower fibers attach to the pubic crest and the pectineal line. Notice that the fibers of the external oblique are passing downwards and medially and the fibers of the internal oblique are traveling perpendicular to this direction. Here is the transversus abdominis muscle. It originates from the thoracolumbar fascia and inguinal ligament. Most of the fibers of this muscle travel in a horizontal direction and attach to the linea alba forming the rectus sheath. Its lower fibers attach to the pectineal line forming the conjoint tendon with the fibers of the internal oblique muscle. This rectus abdominis muscle with its tendinous intersections lies anteriorly. It originates from the pubic symphysis and crest and insert onto the fifth sixth and seventh costal cartilages and the zephoid process. The upper three quarter of the rectus muscle are enclosed within a sheet formed by the aponeurosis of the external and internal obliques and the transus abdominis muscle. This is called the rectus sheet. This is the linea alba formed by the interlacing muscle fibers from the right and left sides. Here is the linea semilunaris along the lateral margin of the rectus muscle. Besides protecting the viscera, the abdominal muscles assist in breathing. The rectus muscles also are powerful flexors of the lumbar and thoracic spine. The external and internal oblique and the transverse abdominis muscles assist in lateral flexion and rotation of the trunk. Weakness in the rectus muscle or its tendon can lead a herniation of the abdominal contents, a ventral hernia. Similarly, the umbilicus is a weak site 
that is prone to herniation. The superior epigastric and inferior epigastric arteries supply the anterior abdominal wall. The superior epigastric artery shown here arises from internal thoracic artery and the inferior epigastric artery arises from the external iliac artery. These two arteries and their parallel veins anastomose around the umbilicus. Therefore, if one of the internal thoracic arteries is lost or its flow is diverted, for example, in the event of a coronary artery bypass graft using the internal thoracic artery, the inferior epigastric artery can supply the abdominal wall with sufficient blood. Additional arteries supplying the abdominal wall include branches from the musculophrenic artery supplying the diaphragm, the 10th and 11th intercostal arteries, and the subcostal artery. The abdominal wall muscles and skin are innervated by the 7th to 12th intercostal nerves in addition to iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves and these will be seen in video 4. The lymphatic drainage of the superficial abdominal wall flows to the axillary and inguinal lymph nodes. Before we introduce the inguinal canal, it's helpful to review the embryology of this region on this model. The testes develop in the abdominal cavity on the posterior abdominal wall, and before birth, they migrate to the scrotal pouch, bringing their blood supply, nerve supply, and venous drainage from that area. As the testes descends, they create a passage and as they pass through the anterior abdominal wall, this is called the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal is an oblique passage that is four centimeter long and passes through the various layers of the abdominal muscles. It is situated on the medial half of the inguinal ligament lying superior to it. It begins at the deep inguinal ring and ends at the superficial inguinal ring near the pubic symphysis. In males, the spermatic cord passes through the inguinal canal. The spermatic cord includes the vas deferens, the testicular artery from the abdominal aorta, the pampaniform plexus of the testicular veins, lymphatics, and autonomic nerves. The cremastric muscle which is formed by the evagination of the internal oblique muscle covers the spermatic cord. Two somatic nerves also travel through the inguinal canal and these are the ilioinguinal nerves and genitofemoral nerves. Here we can see the structures entering the deep inguinal ring from inside the abdominal cavity. This is the vast difference and it enters with testicular artery and the pampiniform plexus of veins. The lymphatics and nerves entering the ring are not visible here. On the medial side of the deep inguinal ring is the inferior epigastric artery. In females, the round ligament of the uterus takes the place of the spermatic cord. Here I will demonstrate the boundaries of the inguinal canal. Some of the structures may not be visible on this projection. The inguinal canal has four sides, a floor, a roof, posterior and anterior walls. The floor is formed by the inward curling of the inguinal ligament laterally and lacunal ligament medially. Its anterior wall is formed by the external and internal oblique muscles. Its posterior wall 
is formed by the fascia transversalis laterally and the conjoint tendon medially. And lastly, its roof is formed by the arching fibers of the transversus abdominis muscle and the internal oblique muscle. The inguinal canal forms a weak area of the abdominal wall. Although the obliquity of the canal helps to compensate for this weakness, it is still a site for herniation. An indirect hernia passes through the deep inguinal ring and herniates through the inguinal canal and the superficial inguinal ring. A direct hernia extends directly from the posterior wall and can pass through the superficial ring. This is the inferior epigastric artery. I would like to mention the relationship of inferior epigastric artery to direct and indirect hernia. An indirect hernia lies lateral to it while the direct hernia lies medial to it. This relationship is clinically important. 